The second week with Vic was a lot smoother. I just kept telling myself everything's fine until I more or less believed it was true. I mean, aside from the ever-present possibility of being murdered by monsters or arrested by homicide detectives, it basically was true. After all, I was now under the protection of King Mercus, an economy-sized monarch from the land of the Fae. To be honest, it didn't really make me feel any safer. I understood the sprites were powerful entities who operate outside our perception of reality, but jeez, they were so small and cute, you know? A King Mercus doll would absolutely clean house at Christmas time. Every kid would want one. Well, Friday finally arrived. All day long, I breathlessly hoped Vic was going to tell me that I'd be paired up with literally anybody else for the next rotation. I didn't give a flying fuck who it was, as long as it wasn't Victor Botticelli. At the end of the day, Vic stopped in on the changing room and said, Hold up a minute. I got a proposition for you. I nodded. Tried to look casual. My stomach was suddenly knotted with tension. Vic smiled down at me and said, I got a temporary position I need to fill, and I got to do it ASAP. I'm going to make you the zoo ambassador, you know, just a couple of weeks, maybe three. It'd save me the trouble of coming in here at night. I can't do late nights no more. Not if I can help it. I like to get my beauty sleep. <laughs> what do you say? I stared at him in confusion. God almighty, what was happening now? I, I rubbed my temples and muttered, What the fresh hell is this? Vic narrowed his eyes and he grunted. What was that? You say something just now? Uh, 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 nothing, I said quickly. Uh, and I hastily added, That sounds interesting, for sure. And what would I do as the, uh, what was it again? The zoo ambassador? Vic's frown smoothed out, and he clapped me on the shoulder. He said, As a zoo ambassador, you gotta be using your expertise to monitor the safety of a film crew. Yeah, it's a small crew, nothing crazy. They'll be working in a terrestrial wing next week. Let them in the habitat so they can do their thing. You know, make sure they don't get killed. That's about it. I thought about what happened with Harry. My fake smile wilted. I didn't want to babysit a bunch of outsiders. They wouldn't know how to act or what to do. It would be a nightmare. Vic saw my expression and said, Hey, I know what you're thinking over there, Billy. You're thinking, I thought this was all a big secret. You know, why, why is there a famous director nosing around a film crew? Uh, the answer's simple. The you know, whole untapped market out there just waiting to get, uh, you know, uh, get tapped. <laughs> A lot of people out there who can afford the price of admission. But for one reason or another, they can't come to the zoo. And maybe they gotta lay low. You know, they're wanted by the FBI, something like that. Maybe it's uh, Interpol who wants it. Maybe they, maybe they run off with another country to avoid getting indicted. All kinds of people can show their faces here in America. Drug cartels, dictators, war criminals. The list goes on. Long story short... There's all these people out there with money in their pockets, and they can't hand it over to Victor Bonicelli. Hey, it doesn't seem right, does it? And then I got his idea, you know. I, I thought to myself, hey, uh, they don't necessarily got to come to me, do they? They could just take the zoo experience over to them. I felt a ray of understanding dawn in my brain. I nodded and murmured, oh, okay, I see. Yeah, it'd be great. Vic exclaimed. A little gold mine is idea. I had uh, my people find a director we could trust. A good one. Not some hack. Rounded up a production crew. We got our funding all lined up. Now they're hard at work filming my masterpiece. Call it uh, uh, Bonesaw Vic's Cryptozoological Gardens. The movie. <laughs> it got a nice ring to it, don't it? I gave him a skeptical look and said, I don't know much about making movies, but I do know it's super expensive. Your movie could only be shown at private events, so I guess the price of admission is going to be pretty steep. 50000 per head, Vic answered in a crisp, cheerful tone. I know it sounds like a lot, but they're not just paying to see the cryptids. They're also paying for the convenience. You know, if, if even a thousand people watch this thing, I'll make at least $30 million. Yeah, I think it's doable. I faintly said... God damn, that's a lot of money. Can't believe there's people out there who can throw that much money around like it's nothing. You know, for those kind of people, 50 large is nothing. Vic chuckled. They piss away 50 grand for noon. They didn't even give a shit. 
They send it over to me instead, right? So uh, I'll take good care of it. <laughs> Anywho, what do you say, Billy? You do this thing for me, I'll be very grateful. Uh, wait, uh, I got something here that I'll... Uh, wait a second, where did I put that friggin'? Ah, uh, there it is. Here, take it. Go on. Yours. Vic pulled something out of the hip pocket of his designer tracksuit and shoved it into my hand. It was a chocolate bar. He gave me a knowing look and folded his arms across his chest. You like candy bars, don't you? Sure you do. Young people fucking love candy bars. <laughs> I love them too, right? So uh, what's not to love, right? You gotta treat yourself sometime. Anyway, a lot more of that came from. Believe me, I got a hookup. Hershey's, Milky Ways, Snickers. Hell, I even got him Mr. Big Bars from north of the border. <laughs> you ever had one of those things? They're pretty freaking good. I'll tell you, them Canadians, they don't want to slap together a candy bar. <laughs> I suspended a bout of wild, cackling laughter, and Vic was trying literally to sweeten the deal with a fucking candy bar. <laughs> Instead, I gave him a solemn nod and said, Thanks, Vic. Look, I'll think about it, okay? I can tell Len my answer by, like, Sunday morning? Is that okay? Vic snatched the candy bar out of my hands and snarled, No, it ain't okay. Read the fucking room, would you? I'm trying to be nice about it over here, kid, and I'm not going to take no for an answer. The word no don't exist for people like me, not coming from people like you, anyway. You have two options here. Yeah or hell yeah. Got it? Victor glared at me, and I felt my throat go as dry as a desert. I squeaked. Uh, yeah, I see. Okay, then. Uh, yeah. Hell yeah. Better? Much better. Vic agreed, and he pushed the chocolate bar back into my hands. Meet the other ambassador in front of the caretaker entrance by 11 p.m. on Monday night. Get suited up. Escort the crew into the service tunnel. Watch out for him. Keep him alive. Wait, who's the other ambassador? And Vic gave me an apologetic smile. The other one's Esmeralda. Hey, hey, come on. You'll be fine. She's a tough nut to crack, sure, but I, I think she's got a soft spot for you. <laughs> I mean... She ain't punched you out yet, right? That's, that's, that's a good sign. I started to grumble, but Vic already walked away. He called over his shoulder. Just do me this one favor, okay? You got this, Billy. Don't even worry about it. And he whispered, God damn it, at his retreating backside. And I sat down at one of the benches that lined the walls. I felt miserable and lonely. I missed working with Casimir. I missed his constantly dour non-expression, a look that felt somewhere between a faint scowl and a vague sadness. I missed his complete bafflement whenever he would discover something new about Western culture. I even missed that harsh bluntness of his banter. That was just his way, and I couldn't imagine him any other way. I wanted to pay the guy a visit, but none of the caretakers or their assistants were allowed to meet up outside of work. It was explicitly forbidden. I could only hope the big guy was on the mend, because he was sorely missed. There was a knock on my door that night, just after 10 p.m. I turned down the volume on the TV and peeked through the peephole. It was Len. I stepped away from the door and called out, Are you here to kill me? Because I'm not going to let you in if you're here to kill me. Len growled. If I was here to do something like that, I wouldn't be knocking. I just let myself in. I snapped. Does everyone know how to pick a lock around here but me? I opened the door. Len walked past me and muttered, I don't gotta pick the lock to get in here, Dumbo. I got a key. What you watching here? You watching the game? I followed him and asked, What game? To which he responded, Any game, kid. I'm a sports junkie. I love it all. Been watching bowling championships, swear to God. Len eased his bulk onto my couch with a deep sigh. He dumped a thick stack of Pringles into his hands from the canister on the coffee table and put up his feet. Make yourself at home, I said sarcastically, and I sat down on a lumpy easy chair across from him. Len nodded agreeably and picked up the remote. You don't just got basic cable, do you? The hell for? Come on, kid, you got some money now. Spend a little, for Christ's sake. Sorry, I haven't had a chance to call them. I apologized in a listless tone. I sat in silence as Len devoured my potato chips and hunted for sports on my TV. He settled on a rebroadcast of a golf game from earlier that day. I silently simmered and looked over at Len, shoveling chips into his mouth and watching golf. 
Finally, I cleared my throat and said, <clears throat> uh, Hey, man, I have a question. What the fuck? You know, I, I mean, seriously. What are you doing here? Len looked over with an expression of mild surprise. He pointed at the TV with a Pringles can and said, We're watching the tube have some snacks, you know, hanging out. I stared at him for a few moments, too stunned to even blink, and then I, I started to laugh. I clapped my hands over his eyes and wheezed. Is this really my fucking life? Like, fucking really? What do you mean by that? Len demanded. What? What? Why are you laughing like a supervillain? I pointed at him and spat. Because this is not how people hang out, Len. They're not all like, I'll kill you because that's my job, and then drop by later to watch golf and eat Pringles. You fucking psycho. I surprised both of us with the anger in my voice. Len gave me a considering look and said, Take it easy over there. I got bored out in the car. Came up here to hang out for a while. Sheesh. What's up your ass? You! I screeched, and I snatched the Pringles out of his hand. I shook the container at him and hollered, You are what's up my ass, Len. You are up my ass literally all the fucking time. You, Vic, the cops, the, the little fey motherfuckers, all of you, all of you pieces of shit are way up my ass, and I can't shit you out. Len let out a sigh and slumped back against the couch. It groaned in protest beneath the considerable girth. He said, I understand where you're coming from, but you're out of line, Billy. In my world, someone like you don't even talk that way to someone like me. But even still, I understand where you're coming from. That's why I'm not going to smash your face in, kid. Once upon a time, many years ago, it'd be a different story, but... I've grown a lot since then. Len shook a finger at me and added, I'm talking about personal growth over here, smartass. I don't hear no fat jokes from you. You're already walking on thin ice. Despite my anger, I had to laugh at this. And it was a genuine laugh. I felt my anger drain away and suddenly... I felt a little bad about yelling at him. I chuckled. I wouldn't dare. Thank you for not beating me up. I appreciate that. Hey, don't mention it, Lynn muttered. He curled his fingers into the beckoning motion and grumbled, I'll give me the Pringles back, would you? I'm starving over here. I passed the canister over and said, Hey, we could order some pizza or something if you want. I already had supper, but I could definitely eat again. Len nodded enthusiastically and shoved a two-inch stack of chips into his mouth. He covered his mouth as he chewed. A curiously delicate gesture for such a Neanderthal-looking fellow. And he said, No, you're talking, Billy. You ever ordered from Gino's? They're over on uh, 8th Avenue. Delicious pizza. Great calzones. Gino happens to be my nephew. But don't hold that against him. <laughs> and he was right. His nephew Gino made a great pizza. It's a great thing that we ordered two extra large pies because Len demolished one of them all by himself. I dropped a chunk of crust to my plate and groaned. That's it, man. No more. I'm stuffed. I've seen starving kids who'd knife you for that pizza crust. Len admonished. You should never waste food. It doesn't matter how rich you are. Wasting food's a sin. You're not wrong, I agreed. But I'm not the one making those kids starve. It's the system. People always blame the system. We made the system, Len countered, and he opened up another can of cola. He drained most of it in one go and then had a soft belch. And back when I was collecting for Jimmy Nichols, we had this one guy who was a real piece of work. Uh, he was always getting himself in trouble. Cards, baseball, ponies. The guy was certified, you know, a gambling addict. It's pretty sad I got to the point where he was into nickels for almost 80 grand. Don't forget, there was the interest on top of that, too. No way in hell he'd ever be able to dig his way out. Uh, nickels took me aside and said, Don't worry about the money. He ain't got it. He ain't never gonna get it, neither. Not that stupid prick. Just bring me his hand. Well, I didn't understand the point of that, but it wasn't my place to question his orders. I just nodded and I asked which hand. Nichols said his dominant hand. You ever tried to wipe your ass with the other hand? It ain't easy. I go over to the guy's house early in the morning. I wait for his wife to leave for work. The guy starts crying. He's begging for his life as soon as he opens the door. I shoved him back inside, told him, relax, I ain't here to kill you. Let's talk in the kitchen. 
So I go to the kitchen, I ask him, which one's your dominant hand? Turns out the guy's completely ambidextrous. <laughs> Made him demonstrate by signing his name with both hands. Well, it was pretty impressive, so. Flipped a quarter, heads his left hand, tails his right. Came up tails, so I held a little prick over the sink with my gun to his head, and I chopped his right hand off with a meat cleaver. I shifted uncomfortably in my chair. And murmured, That's fucking awful, Jesus Christ. How does that even relate to your original point? Lynn said, Just a minute, kid. Then he heaved himself off the couch. He took both pizza boxes to the kitchen and called out, You got a plate or something to wrap up in here? I'll take care of this for you. Len washed his hands on the sink and came back to the living room with another can of cola in each hand. He handed one to me and then sank back into the couch with a satisfied groan. Anyway, just before I swung the meat cleaver, the guy starts bitching that it wasn't his fault. He got in the hot water. He blames the system, said it was making it impossible for him to realize his dreams. He said, Gambling. It was the only way the common man could ever hope to get ahead in life. I looked him in the eye with the cleaver hanging in the air. Told him you can't blame the system. It was us who made the system. We all joined together, staged a revolt at any time. No one's stopping it. And no matter how you slice it, it's still your fault. Then he chopped his fucking hand off. They grimaced and said, That's fucking horrible. I mean, yeah, I, I guess it was his own fault, but still, what did Nichols do with the hand? Gave it to his border collie. Then said placidly, cute little guy named was uh, Patches. As I recall, Patches, he ate a piece of the thumb, threw it up on the carpet. Nichols tossed the hand in the incinerator after that, and poof, gone. Yeah, that's grim, I muttered. Hey, I have a question for you, Len. Uh, that whole Lenny the Barber thing? Len shifted in his seat and looked down at his lap. He said, Back then, everyone was always hopped on coke. It was everywhere. All the wise guys were doing it, not the older ones. You know, the mustache peats. But a lot of us younger guys were flying almost all the time. It was a lifestyle, you know. Us guys would get too fucked up sometimes. Things would uh, get out of hand. Anyway, I was out at a club with some of the guys one night. All of us coked up to the eyeballs. Mario Gambaldi. He got into it with some asshole at the bar. I recognized the guy. He wasn't anything to worry about, if you know what I mean. Just another greasy mook with a big mouth. I wandered over. I told him to make himself scarce. He turned away like he was about to leave, and then he took a swing at me. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen. Me and Mario cleaned his clock. Just went off and stomped the nuts and guts out of this prick. There was blood all over the bar, the floor. It was everywhere. So we got to yanking him up by the hair and dragging him out, right? And this friggin' scalp almost comes off. Because he must have had a pretty good split across his hairline because it peeled back all the way to the crown of his skull. I stared at him in silent horror. Gino's delicious pizza rolling in my guts. Lenny shook his head and rumbled, Yeah, I know, it was pretty bad. Guys, though, guys all thought it was the best thing they'd ever seen. Keep egging me on, do it again. After a while, it kind of became my trademark. I made the timeout symbol with my hands and said, Okay, that's, that's, that's really bad. Like, just, ugh. Let, let's stop right there. You're right, Len said quietly. It is really bad. That's who I was. There's no use pretending otherwise. Like I said, I've grown since then. I quit snorting the nose candy. Got serious about the job. Started chasing a promotion in the ranks, and now here I am, babysitting your stupid ass, Billy. Some promotion, huh? Better than ripping people's scalps off, I shot back. And Len gave me a wry grin. Yes, yeah, fair enough, kid. Anyway, I need to get serious here for a minute. Now, as Vic was saying the other day, the cops have been swarming around the past few weeks, asking questions, busting balls. I don't think much about it at the time, because it's just what cops do, busting balls kind of thing, but Vic's, and Vic's been getting curious about the whole thing, and it ain't good. He wants to know who got rid of the hippie. He wants to know why. Now, I ain't going to tell nobody what happened, and I'm sure you aren't going to be blabbing about it either, but I don't mean he won't find out. 
He's got a source on the outside, if you know what I mean. I gave him a puzzled frown and said, No, I honestly have no idea what you mean. Like, I'm sure he's got eyes in a lot of places, but that's, that's not what you're talking about, is it? Nah. I'm saying he's got a source on the outside of reality. I'm talking about the succubus. Whenever Vic really wants to know something, he'll feed someone to the succubus in return for information. How would she know anything? I demanded. She's locked up in a vault made of lead, for Christ's sake. Not all of her, Lynn corrected. She exists in two realities at once. She's here in our world, and she's also in the other world. Lynn was looking at me like I actually knew what he was talking about. Which I certainly did not. I asked, what other world? Are you talking about the afterlife? Len shrugged and said, I don't know. If anyone's ever gone there, they sure as hell didn't come back. As I understand it, the other world is right beside us, but it's also very far away. It's kind of hard to explain, but trust me, she can see. So what am I supposed to do? I demanded. I, and I opened my soda can with a savage yank on the pull tab. It's not like I could just sit down and ask her to stay quiet. Probably get eaten alive. Len stared at the TV, his eyes glinting beneath the heavy ridge of his brow. After a while, he said, You'll be working nights with that film crew for the next few weeks, right? Not many people around tonight. Lots of opportunities if you get in the drift. I felt my heart miss a beat in my chest. I narrowed my eyes and asked, What do you mean? Well, maybe you should beat Vic to the punch. Offer the succubus a trade of your own. I gaped at him with growing dismay. I shrank away from him and said, No frickin' way, I, I can't do that, Linda. That's too far. Seems like you don't got much choice. Men observed in a dry tone. If you can get her to stay quiet about the situation with the snitch, you're golden. She always keeps a promise. If Vic gets there first, you're a dead man, and unfortunately... I'll be the one who makes you dead. So, with all that in mind, I asked, what about you? And Len's frown turned into a slant smirk. I'll be fine. I told you already, you can't touch a man-made without permission. I snorted. Really? Because I kind of doubt Vic got permission to turn Sal into a fucking vampire, my man. I mean, no, he just went ahead and did it. What about Nichols? Did he get the green light to kill the boss and take over? Didn't have full support across the board, no. Len admitted, but there's a whole different can of worms. What are you trying to say here, kid? I'm saying he did it to Salvatore and Nichols, so what's stopping him from doing it to you? But don't act like you haven't already thought about this. Len gave me a tired look. Reluctantly, he said, Yeah, I'll admit it crossed my mind. Look, kid. Don't get self-righteous on me. Don't forget the only reason I got rid of Vincent in the first place was to keep you out of trouble. Maybe I was right, maybe I was wrong. At this point, it doesn't matter. It boils down to this, okay? We need to guarantee her silence, and we need to do it as soon as possible. If it gets there first, we're going to disappear. They'll consider it housekeeping. Just keeping things clean and tidy. I jumped out of my chair and started pacing around my living room. I snapped, I can't believe you. You're all, like, I know, we'll cover up our involvement in this murder by committing another murder. What the fuck is that? I'm not gonna freaking kill anybody, okay? Are you crazy? The answer's no, Len. I, I can't stress that enough. You Just fucking no. Nope. There's gotta be another way. Well, there ain't. Len countered Riley. Listen to me, okay? I can't do this thing myself. If I could, we wouldn't even be having this conversation right now. Thing is... I got no business hanging around the zoo after hours. If I went to the zoo at night, Vic would be wondering why. No, has to be you. Look, I met these people. Believe me, most of them are douchebags. Just pick the one you hate the most. Let nature take its course. Say, say it was an accident. I spun around to face him and choked. An accident, Len? How the hell would that even be an accident? You're literally going to punch in the code, pull the fucking door open. What, what am I going to tell Vic? Then I, I tripped and accidentally pressed all four buttons on my way down? No, dumbass, Len grunted. This is what you're going to do. 
On your first night, go talk to the succubus. Make a deal. Don't listen to any of her bullshit. And for Christ's sake, don't look in the friggin' window. Just stand outside the door. Do the talking in your head. And when you reach an agreement, bring in the target and find an excuse to leave. I'm standing by her door. Maybe you forgot something. Maybe you gotta take a piss. Whatever works. The succubus will take care of the rest. I rubbed my temples and groaned. It's fucked up. Okay, let's say I actually go through with this. How and when do I give the target the gate code? There's cameras, microphones all over the place. I told you. Succubus will take care of it. You don't think she knows the door code? Of course she does. She knows just about everything. Len heaved himself to his feet and started heading for the door. Thanks for the pizza, kid. We should do this again sometime. I chased after him and exclaimed, Are you not listening to me? I'm not going to do it. Len paused at the doorway and gave me a heavy lidded stare. He said, Do what needs to be done, Billy. Or else. That's all I can say. Have a good night. I sat in the indent Lynn had left on my couch and brooded for a long time. I didn't think I had it in me to commit murder, and especially not in cold blood. I didn't know what to do. I was backed into a corner with no place to run. I thought to myself, Here goes nothing, and yelled out, Hey, King Mercus, it's, it's me, your loyal subject, Billy Whitebread. You said I was under your protection, right? Well, I could use some help right about now, your majesty. Hello? Hello? Come on, where are you? I gave you my best felty and I fucking really hope it actually means something. Come on. I really need protection over here. A low, raspy voice piped up by my elbow and asked, What seems to be the problem, loyal subject? I flinched away in surprise and almost fell off the couch. There was a humanoid creature standing beside my couch. He was a bearded, scowling little guy that looked about two feet tall. My diminutive visitor was dressed like a working man from the early 1900s, right down to the flat cap and suspenders. His shirt sleeves were rolled up to reveal hairy, muscular little forearms. One of them sported an anchor tattoo, and the other was adorned with a crudely drawn mermaid. It looked like a cross between a toddler and a dock worker. I demanded, Who are you? What are you? He gave me an incredulous look and said, Oh, you think I am a giraffe? I'm obviously a gnome. He held out a tarnished badge that was pinned to his shirt and added, Sheriff Bolo the Brave at your service. How can I be assistance? I held up my hands and said, I'm still learning about all this stuff, so no disrespect. The gnome rolled his eyes at me. He muttered, Why are humans so ignorant of the natural world? Well, what's the nature of your emergency? Someone's going to kill me? Who? The gnome demanded. I don't see anybody but you and myself. Why do they want to kill you? And when? Uh, not just yet, I admit it. I mean, no one's trying to kill me right at this very moment, but it's probably going to happen soon. Blotto gave me a weathering look and growled, Do you know it's a crime to abuse King's protection? You're too pretty for the dungeon, my boy. I shook my head violently and said, No, this is real. Uh, how do I explain this? Uh, so, I have to make sure my boss doesn't find out about some stuff that happened. If he does, he'll probably kill me. The only way I could do this is to feed someone to a succubus. I really, really don't want to do that. Does that make sense? Lotto gave me a sour look and said, No, not at all. Nonetheless, I can already tell this is a waste of my time. If you aren't already being attacked, there's nothing I can do. I felt my heart sink. So, what am I supposed to do? I demanded. You won't help me until after I've already been murdered? I'm afraid so. Sheriff Blotto agreed. This individual hasn't committed a crime. I can't protect you from an act of violence that isn't happening, can I? Our laws don't work that way. Look, all I need is for King Mercus to intervene somehow, I pleaded. Can he talk to the succubus for me? I mean, he's a king of the magic folk, right? He he's got to have some pull there. Demons and demigods have their own government, Blotto interjected briskly, and he started for the door. Sorry, King Mercus isn't in the supreme ruler of all creation. He has his own subject to worry about. And I think he does an excellent job. 
This sounds like a matter for the civil courts. Call me if you're being murdered. I watched with my mouth hanging open as Blotto walked through the wall beside the door and disappeared. I couldn't believe it. Even in the world of magic creatures, bureaucracy was the real king. I croaked, well, fuck me then, I guess. And for the first time in my life, I attempted to punch a hole in the drywall. I had a spot that was supported by a wall stud and banged on my knuckles instead. My anger instantly evaporated in a wave of pain. Swearing to myself like a sailor, I cradled my bleeding fist against my chest and rinsed my wounds in the kitchen sink. As I watched the spidery threads of crimson swirl down the drain, I tried my damnedest to not start blubbering like a baby. And I failed. Miserably. It appeared there would be no way around this horrible dilemma. In order to save my own hide, I would have to sacrifice someone else in the worst way possible. Kaz had told me the succubus devours her prey completely. Mind, body, and soul. I could barely even think about it without feeling sick to my stomach. But therein lies the true dilemma. I didn't want to die either. So just how far was I willing to go in order to save my own hide? It appeared I was about to find out. I'd never felt so incredibly alone before. This situation was too big to face on my own, but who could I turn to? Casimir. That was who. I had to find Kaz. He'd know what to do. It was forbidden for the caretakers to speak to each other outside of work, not to mention that I didn't even know where he lived, but I desperately needed to hear his voice. I had roughly 76 hours to find him, lots of time really, but I had no idea where to start looking. A light bulb flickered inside my stressed out brain. The zoo, that's where I would start. They might have a record of our addresses at work. According to Victor himself, nobody paid much attention to the cameras on the weekend. I'd just tell the guards that I left something in my changing booth, and then I would sneak into the office to talk to Miss Dahlia. There'd be no guarantee that she would tell me where to find Kaz, but it was probably the best place to start. Ah, uh, the beautiful Miss Dahlia with her raven hair and enormous eyes, the achingly gorgeous and compelling Miss Dahlia. Shut up, idiot, I said out loud. She can definitely do better than you, so calm down. The main problem was Len. I wasn't often aware of his presence, but I knew he was probably following me around. I'd have to shake him off my trail before I could visit Kaz, but how? The light bulb gave me another flicker. I smiled to myself. I knew exactly how I could make him forget about tailing me for a while. It was risky, but it would work. It was best not to dwell on that. I was learning many lessons during my time at the zoo, but the most important lesson was this. Don't think too hard about what might go wrong. You'll never get the courage to get out of bed in the morning. Softly, I murmured, Coming to see you, Cass. I sure hope you have some over there. At that moment, the phone began to ring. I answered it and accidentally opened another can of worms. Such is life when you're a caretaker's assistant. For those of you guys that like getting cozy while listening to stories, I'm going to let you know about Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. That's my wife's tea shop. She sells hand blended teas. There's creepy pasta based teas if you want to get one that's a flavor that you like, or there's Mr. Creepy Pasta Tea, which happens to be a tea that I drink fairly often. Some other ones I really suggest, the Gashel Greens, which is also one that I drink, and the Hibiscus, which has helped me out a lot with my high blood pressure. Uh, if you guys also like the, if you want to see like the Hibiscus tea, I think it's also called the Jeff the Killer tea. So, goddamn, Jeff is constantly in my life and there's no escaping him. Once again, that's Etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Dana Krause, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kyle Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Crownable, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Estebean, Nick Cole, Our Minsect Time, Xylobones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Love it a Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Carolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Ika Mount, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Myver, Sashi Sasaku, Broken Up 509, Stricket, Ready Kruger, Lisa Cottrell, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiri the Sloth, Bester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. 
Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below. And thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming.